So people are f still uh, still filing in, but um, I think we should start now. So hello everyone, and thanks for coming to this session. My name is Roland Kuhn, and I work for TypeSafe, uh, where I lead the ACA project. Uh, the ACA project is an actor implementation on the JVM. Uh, but I will not talk about that uh, in, in this presentation. In this presentation, I will concentrate on what it means to go reactive, what this uh, new buzzword that you might have heard is all about. And I hope to convince you that it is more than just a buzz uh, buzzword, that there is uh, really some substance behind it. Um, you have seen one implementation uh, of a framework that supports uh, reactive application development before by Tim Fox with the Vertex project. Uh, but in, in, in this presentation, I will look at it uh, from, from uh, higher above and uh, talk about the four tenets of the uh, reactive manifesto. Who here in the audience has seen the reactive manifesto before? That's quite a lot, nice. And who of you has, has actually signed it? Okay, also nice. There are nearly uh, 6,000 signatures on it by now. So uh, it, it just as a, as a short overview, the reactive manifesto is not about prescribing any particular technology or language or runtime or whatever. It is just about describing a common vocabulary, uh, vocabulary for formulating for very desirable properties uh, every modern application uh, will likely have. Um, these four traits, as we call them, are from the top to bottom responsiveness, which means that we need to respond to the users when someone wants something off the application, there needs to be a response. And uh, then we have derived from that, uh, well, we need to respond even uh, during failure conditions so we need our application to, to be resilient. We need to be able to respond to the user even if the load is varying greatly. And that leads uh, to the desire to be scalable. And we'll see throughout uh, the discussion of how we go about implementing solutions for this, uh, that it always comes back to being uh, based on events, uh, based on asynchronous uh, information uh, passing and message passing between components. You can read up more on reactivemanifesto.org um, if you're interested. So uh, let's start out by one thing which we need to get out of the way first. Uh, I used that word before already. So um, we need to clarify what is a user. Uh, there have been several discussions lately also and on the manifesto itself, um, which um, warrant, okay, we, ne we need to be clear about this. When you normally hear the word, the user, uh, as in we're developing software for the user, you think a bit about, l about it like this. You have the human who's sitting in front of the web browser. That's typically the um, uh, goal to uh, provide services to real humans. But we all know that this is a vastly oversimplified picture. That is not really how, how, it, how it happens. Uh, the human user only interacts with the browser, but behind this web browser, there is a whole lot of infrastructure uh, needed to make all of this work. And we all know that. So the web browser makes uh, typically an HTTP request um, to some front-end server, and this front-end server will uh, dispatch um, requests, uh, will not deal with requests directly, typically. Uh, it will uh, dispatch to internal services for handling these requests. Uh, we could Take one example, uh, the uh, Gmail application, which is one that I happen to use frequently, uh, which is, I, I'm, I'm not privy to the details, but uh, it sure is implemented somewhat like this. So whenever I open my web browser, it makes a, a request to that uh, website. Uh, but before I can see my list of emails, uh, a whole lot of work has to be done in the back end. So the browser is a user of the services of the front end server but the front-end server itself utilizes the services provided, for example, by an email storage or by a contact service or, or all kinds of uh, things. There's also advertisements in there, I guess. 
uh, which could be an external service. So this front-end server makes lots of calls to internal services. And each of these might in turn use other internal services. So if you have uh, the um, contact pop-up, which you get when you hover your mouse over uh, an email address, you get this little window there, and there's typically some kind of avatar or uh, image for the person. These bits must come from somewhere. And I guess that's just a sort of um, binary storage service, which is used by the contact service to retrieve uh, this image when needed. So to be very clear, when, we, when I say user and service, I mean all these relationships. User is not just the human. Services can use other services. They consume them. Now, what is the single most important thing, the single most important quality of a service? It needs to respond. When you send a request to a web server, you need to get a response back. Otherwise, you don't know what happened. Uh, if you don't get a, uh, some sort of answer, uh, the request might never ha have arrived. It might not be processed, it might have failed mid midway or anything. So responsiveness is the topmost thing that we need. We need an answer. But there's one very important side question. When do we need that answer? How long are you willing to wait? We have become a very, a very, um, uh, nah, what's the word? Impatient, impatient crowd uh, nowadays. We need uh, our services that we use um, to be available all the time and to respond very quickly. So when I browse my emails uh, on Gmail and I click on a label and I want to see these, uh, well, if it takes more than three seconds, I'm beginning to wonder whether the network is broken. So um, responsiveness uh, is relative to the use case, obviously. Um, but the times are over where we can just uh, like take half a minute before we signal anything to anyone. On the other end of the spectrum, you have high-frequency high trading, um, wh which is uh, uh, very, very uh, dependent on being precisely fast. So there you can uh, have the requirement that you need a response within 100 microseconds, for example, or sometimes even 10 microseconds. Uh, that is... Um, going in the near real-time uh, range. Now, uh, there is one reason why uh, this uh, time which it takes um, to, uh, to answer a request is uh, important as well. Um, you ha when you ask someone a question and you don't get a reply, at some point you have to decide that something went wrong here. The question was not received, for example. It's like with the kids. I, I ask something and they never reply. They probably weren't listening. So we need to define a timeout after which we declare this to be failed. And this timeout defines how long we must wait in case something goes wrong. So we can't have this really like 30 seconds, like a, a TCP connect timeout. We need this to be as short as we well need the, the, responsi the responsiveness of our application to be. And this mean means um, we need to provide bounded service latency and the service Latency bound uh, needs to be appropriate for the use case. Bounded latency means, uh, as I explained, uh, that the time between the serv service receives the request and when it replies um, cannot be above, say, 100 milliseconds for a certain service because otherwise clients will assume that it failed. And there is no point replying at a later time. Now, this uh, sounds uh, rather, um, this is a rather strict requirement. And uh, now the question is, how can we implement such things? There are several things we can do. And uh, one thing uh, is a very uh, core idea uh, in that um, typically uh, in previous architectures, we used to do things in sequence like, like this. So you get a, a service um, request in your servlet, for example, uh, which then does things A, B, C, and wraps them up together and sends them back as a response to the client. If A, B, and C are actually other services, which frequently is the case, which are called uh, using some RPC mechanism, uh, then we are now waiting for, well, how long can A maximally take how long can B maximally take and how long can C maximally take? And then we add them together and that's our, uh, our latency which we need to declare 
the maximum latency which this service can take. Uh, this clearly can get out of hand. If you look at, for example, your LinkedIn profile, uh, rendering that page um, takes uh, in ac into account uh, about 100 backend calls. So this chain would be insanely long and it would just not be workable like this. So what we need to do is we need to, oh sorry, we need to parallelize. Assuming that A, B and C in this case do not have a dependency on each other, so the output from A is not needed for B and C, for example, uh, we can run them in parallel. We have multiple computers in our computing center, they have multiple cores and so on, so there is no real reason stopping us. Uh, the only thing is uh, there is this new concept which we need to incorporate, namely that we need to spin off A, B and C without actually waiting for their result. We need to go asynchronous. This is crucial uh, in order to be able to do things in parallel. There is just no other way. And then um, before we can reply to the, to the client, uh, if you're looking at um, Java EE for example, well we need to tie these threads together, we need to wait for the three results and then we can hand it back uh, to, the, to the caller. This is already a gain, we are not waiting for the sum of A, B and C in, 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 in timing wise, we are waiting just for the maximum, wh whatever takes longest. Uh, there's one thing more, one step more we can go, especially uh, since Java 8 introduced these nice completable futures. Uh, we can nowadays, instead of waiting at the green dot for all the things to become available, we can just kind of leave, leave these uh, post-it notes. We attach callbacks to when these futures for A, B and C are fulfilled. And these post-it notes say, uh, okay, when A, B and C are done, wrap them together in this data structure and that goes back to the client. This means that the service call, so going from the purple to the green dot, basically takes no time at all. It just uh, defines what needs to be done and how to react when it is done and that just gets packaged up as some closures which um, sit there waiting for the result. This is going event-driven. This is what it's about. It means that your application, instead of specifying I'm doing this and wait for that and that and wait for it, you define how to react to the events that occur. You create some initial events and you let them percolate through your system. When things come back, you define how to treat the result. Another thing, things will invariably go wrong. That is clear. So uh, if I am a service, I'm providing a service and I have a certain constraint. Uh, I cannot take longer than 100 milliseconds uh, to do whatever it is I'm doing and I need help from someone else. Um, that someone else might actually fail, might not be there, uh, might not reply. Uh, instead of then um, having this failure propagate, we need to isolate it. And that is a well-known thing in electrical engineering. We install a circuit breaker. It works a bit like this. Um, so normally you are on, on the center line, so you just do the work, which in this case m might be calling another service, uh, and if everything works, well, just that's just fine. In addition, we uh, use a stopwatch, a timer, uh, to just keep track of how long this service takes uh, for responding, and then uh, when that is cost consistency too long, consistently violating its latency bound, we just switch to another path which means that uh, we do not compromise our own SLA. We, we can respond within our own allotted time. Um, we isolate ourselves from possible misbehaving other components that we rely upon. Now, failing fast can mean different things. In the most trivial way, you can just fail the request. You can say, I'm currently not able to, to do this, whatever that is. Um, there are other... Uh, Options. One real example which I've uh, uh, heard about at the um, play day with all the, all the webinars was from the um, um, CTO of the Huffington, Huffington Post who gave the example uh, of a rather similar um, setup where they render a page and they uh, have a, an advertisement which they can place in there but the, adver the, the adver advertisement is not really crucial. You, you want to see your article and, well, if there is no advertisement on the page, 
well, it, that's a few clicks lost, so to speak. But that's better than not showing things to the users, because the users will just go somewhere else if they see a website that is not responding. So failing fast there would mean, instead of an advertisement uh, that you placed carefully, you can show some default, for example. So you can gracefully degrade the service while still keeping your latency bounds. Another thing is, whenever you have queues in your system, for items to trickle through the queue takes time. And there are many queues uh, which you need to be aware of, uh, more than you see at the surface. When you send data over the network, you have, for example, the TCP send buffer uh, on one machine, then you have the data in flight, which might be buffered on routers, you have the receive buffer on the receiving machine, then you dispatch the request to some thread pool there, so the, th the thread pool has a queue into which it puts tasks all these are queues, and events need to go through all of them before they can be processed, before they even reach the service. The service has this nice uh, uh, latency bound defined and implemented, but whatever occurs before the request actually gets to the service is purely added to this, and it will eventually uh, make the service fail from the perspective of the user, because the user doesn't know, is it the network which is slow or is it the service? So what you can do there is uh, you can apply a variation of Little's uh, result, uh, which is taking uh, reasonably stable average processing times. I if you multiply the queue length by the processing time of your service, uh, then that gives you a rough estimate of uh, the latency which will be incurred by elements queued at that point. If you have a certain maximum, so you have this bounded latency, and you see that the queue length times the processing time is going to make you violate your latency bound, then it's much better to reply immediately, just like with the circuit breaker, uh, and to degrade the service in instead of not responding. Because not responding is the thing that users really uh, don't react too kindly to these days. This uh, forces you also to think about the propagation of your units of work uh, among the communication channels and the various infrastructure pieces. It basically means that you need to consider the event-driven or message-driven nature of your application when it comes to sending a request somewhere and getting the response back. And once, uh, if you do that, you can actually think about these queues in a very explicit fashion. Instead of having them, so instead of saying, I make my TCP buffers larger because then I can have more requests before I start failing in, in some, some awkward fashion, um, I would recommend actually the, the opposite. You make your buffers, which are implicit, as small as possible, and you make your, um, uh, the, the recipient um, pick off the, the elements, which the work items which come in as quickly as possible from the network, for example, and put them in an explicit queue, because only then can you apply this bounding. Uh, and only then do you know how many items are in the queue, and only then can you give them a, a, a special treatment to uh, fail fast or degrade the service when you need to. Now, consider that you have written an application or implemented some services, and you've t carefully designed everything with circuit breakers on one side, bounded queues on the other side, and uh, nicely um, uh, implemented your bounded latencies. Um, still, things will go wrong. We all know it, it's, it's software. We all make mistakes, but it's not only that. Resilience is um, the need to respond in case of failure, and failures can be manifold. There are many different uh, ways in, in which things can go wrong. It's not, it's not only the um, exception which you forgot to handle or that breaking condition of the while loop which you somehow got wrong and then it spins into an endless loop or that deadlock which you put in. It's not only software which can fail, it's of course al also hardware. Most of most people have, uh, in somewhere or another, uh, dealt with with hardware, not only no notebooks, but uh, I have administered the 
uh, service of uh, the chair at university uh, for several years. And it, yeah, it's incredible how, many, uh, how often things fail. Um, you can make your power supply, for example, redundant, but that doesn't help if someone pulls out bu both plugs, as happened to us. The cleaning personnel just wanted to plug some yeah, vacuum cleaner. Um, so all kinds of things will fail. That was a human example failure. There was a study showing that um, if you take decently trained uh, system administrators under a no-stress situation and you ask them to repair a RAID 5 under Linux, then there was a 10% chance that they replaced the wrong drive, leading to the loss of all data. I mean, everybody has a bad day from time to time. So it's important that we think not of failure avoidance, we think of failure tolerance, fault tolerance. We want our system to stay responsive even when these things go wrong. S and that is what we call resilience. Now there's just one way to achieve that. And that one way is don't put all your eggs in one basket. You need to distribute. Uh, th these are computers. Um, it's symbolic for many different ways or axes uh, uh, along your which you can distribute. It's not just that you put three servers in your rack or that you put three racks in your um, computing center. You could have computing centers on different continents if you're really paranoid about a particular set of data. You can have uh, these administered by different teams doing not all the same thing at the same time because you don't want all to fail at the same time and so on. You need to distribute in order to obtain resilience. Distribution has uh, some nice properties. Nice in the sense that, uh, or let's say interesting, has some interesting properties in that um, they force us to think differently uh, about how we program. Because distributed means that the components which are participating in this dis distributed system can fail independently. So I have a program running on node A and a program running on node B and they communicate um, and if I don't get a reply back for some request, ah, is this still working? If I don't get a reply back uh, for, for a request, that could mean that it was never actually s uh, uh, sent over the network or failed on the network, or it failed on node B, or the reply didn't come back. There are many more failure modes. But uh, one, uh, one crucial point to, to observe here, the message needs to travel from A to B, and that takes time and it needs to travel from B to A, and again, that takes time. This means that the processing in such a program is fundamentally asynchronous. There is no such thing as synchronous distributed computing. Uh, that, that even doesn't work um, uh, because of the finite speed of light. Uh, so there are physical limits to this. This means that if we don't want systems with a thing which are single point of failures, we need to distribute, and the need to distribute means that we need to go asynchronous. We've seen uh, in the case of the parallel fan out um, that that had some consequences on the way we program. These same consequences uh, also apply when we distribute, of course. We need constructs in our, in our libraries or languages which allow us to express that things are asynchronous and then we will have to define what happens when, for example, a re reply comes back later. And we don't know how long that will take. But there is really, really the, the nice part to it that asynchronous systems where I can send a message here and I'm not affected by the processing over there because it's just sending a message. I'm not even waiting for it. That means that failures of A and B, which can occur and independently, are also kept independent. They are isolated from each other. And this is uh, inspired by um, shipbuilding and we therefore call it the bulkheading pattern. 
What we want to have is compartments which can fi fail in isolation because we know that failure will happen, but where one failure shall not take down all the others. Now we have uh, seen one example of uh, this pattern being applied in the history. It was uh, one of the first applications of this building pattern uh, and we have seen that it failed horribly. We all know the Titanic actually sunk, even though it was declared to be unsinkable. So it's instructive to look at how that happened and why that happened. The Titanic uh, had 15 compartments and um, they were built as bulkheads, which went a bit o above the, the waterline. And then when it, rammed, uh, when it ran into the uh, iceberg, um, the first three or four of them were ripped open. That should not have been a problem, but the compartments were not really perfect. They were just walls with no, isolated with no closed ceiling, and they didn't really go high up in order not to inconvenience the first-class passengers. So uh, what happened was that water uh, filled the first three compartments and then um, the, uh, what's that, stern uh, bow sank into the water, uh, thereby uh, the water then flowed over the bulkheads. So the bulkheads were not perfect and this led to a catastrophic cascading failure. Why am I mentioning this? Um, we can see this uh, also if we use um, application, server, uh, application servers as uh, the unit for bulkheading, so to speak. So imagine that you have three servers with a load balancer in front and one of them fails. Then the other two will have to take the load of the combined one, uh, the, the load for all the three, which can easily lead to a cascading failure due to overload. Or you have one which is uh, the front end for, uh, for the database one. The database fails. Requests take an awful lot of time to time out. Uh, that one runs out of threads, kills over, kills the application. So the important part about bulkheading is that it needs to be complete. There cannot be this kind of strong coupling of one compartment onto the other. And this means that we need to focus completely on asynchronous message passing and not doing synchronous RPC between these compartments. Now, if we have implemented that uh, and we send a request and the other compartment has failed or is failing or doesn't reply for any reason, there is only one thing we can do. We can wait for a timeout and we make these timeout events explicit and in choosing the timeout we have a very helpful guide because we implemented this latency bound. That's what it's good for. There is one problem though, because uh, if you have normal, uh, like Java, normal control flow in your program, you call some module here, uh, what hap typically is done in case of failure, an exception is thrown. And this exception is then bubbling up the call stack uh, through all the modules which called it, and some of them hopefully will handle it. But if we isolate these compartments, there is no call stack. You get the request over the network, for example, and if things blow up here, then the exception just kills the JVM, for example. So, what shall we do? It is someone else's exception, so we should also make it someone else's problem. That is called supervision. This diagram shows it. Requests and responses go in the, the horizontal plane and failure goes orthogonal to that, goes to some other place. Now, uh, in order to, to distinguish between different kinds of responses and failures, I'd like to uh, show you a little example. Consider a vending machine. So you're thirsty and you want to buy some coffee, for example, from a vending machine. So you walk, walk over to the vending machine and you put in your coins and then you press the button for a hot, hot cup of coffee. Now, if you had the right coins and the machine is fully functional and everything works, you get your coffee. That's a successful reply from the machine. There could be different things going wrong. For example, it could not have been the right coins because you somehow messed it up. And then the machine will say, ah, this is not the right amount. That's okay. That's a valid response. The machine responds to you. Uh, the machine could say, out of beans, for example. That is also a valid response. But the machine could also be broken. It could, be have, it could have no power. Uh, the, um, 
uh, logic board which would give you the response could be broken, anything like that. In that case, you will not get a response. But what will you do in real life? You will probably not, you'll probably not fix the machine on the spot because you are the user of the machine. The owner has to fix the machine. The owner is making money off of selling uh, the, the coffee, so wants to take the, the, the coins out which you put in. So it's important to note that failure is the condition where the service cannot operate any longer, and failure goes to the owner, while all other responses, including the negative ones, so validation errors and so on, they all go to the user. Yeah? Failure is up is the, the owner, and responses of all kind is uh, horizontal is uh, on the user plane. Now this means that the system, that this component will also have to be uh, event-driven. Requests can arrive at any time, things can go wrong, and there is this supervisor which, which will have to have the power to fix the machine. So the supervisor can also talk to this service and the service doesn't know from which side uh, communication will have to be expected next, so this service will have to react to events from multiple sources. There's one uh, feature um, which, which we've seen in, in, in Vertex uh, a little bit, um, which, we've, which we can see in Akka as well. I think we will see more implementations like that. Uh, is that if it does not matter how your communication works, so if it looks the same talking to a component which is in the same JVM or somewhere else, then, can then you can use this feature, which we call location transparency, also to um, resilience to the supervision part, and thereby we get uh, seamless resilience across, for example, a cluster of nodes. Next one. Scalability is defined as the responsiveness in the face of changing load. And for that, well, you have implemented an application, you have taken care of bounded latency, you have made it resilient, uh, and everything is nice. You might have even had a good idea, which is useful to lots of people, they just don't know it yet. At some point, someone will write some blog posts about it, put it on Reddit or, or Hacker News, and then everybody will come and want to check it out. And pe users will come to your service and they will hit it. They will hit it hard. And when that happens, that is exactly the moment when you cannot afford it to fail because you're just about to become famous uh, or known or for that matter. So how do, we, how do we not mess this up? This is something which has happened to, to many, uh, many uh, good and uh, small ideas which then didn't make it uh, because they were simply forgotten after yeah there was this hot air and nothing was behind it I just got my failure responses or not no responses at all how do we deal with that so the first thing you need to notice is there is a certain limit to what one node can do you can buy the biggest box if you want, but even that one has a finite number of CPUs and memory and disk and, and so on. So there is a certain limit to what you can do with one computer. And that means you need to distribute. You need to scale out your processing. How can you scale out your processing? It's only possible if you can exploit parallelism in your, prog uh, in your problem. Now, for most of these internet services, we are talking about work items, work streams or requests coming in from thousands or millions of users and most of the time we can find a way to partition this stream. We can partition it by user ID or it might simply not matter, uh, um, there is no cor correlation between different requests a user makes. Um, so take an, uh, a translation service for example, a translation service is not personalized, you can send any text and a language from and to uh, and it doesn't matter which node in your huge cluster handles it. That would be trivially distrib distributable. The important point is that you need to make, uh, you need to find a way to partition this incoming stream of work. The other thing is um, coordination will kill you. If there is coordination to be done between the replicas uh, for every request, then uh, that is not helping 
because coordination overhead will just grow way faster than the benefits um, if you go beyond just very trivial sizes. So the trick is to share nothing between these replica. Nothing is relative, but it's a, it's a term to keep in mind. So um, it's okay to disseminate um, in an offline fashion certain background data which you need for processing, but what you cannot have is, for example, that you take a global distributed lock in order to answer a request. That would not scale at all. And if you do that, uh, you get um, the ability, so you have a partitionable work stream, and you don't share between the replicas um, any, any resources. That means that you can conveniently scale up, but also scale down. People normally talk only about scaling up, um, but that can get costly very quickly. If you think about Netflix, um, they serve a very large fraction of the um, internet traffic during the US evenings, um, but not so much during the mornings, for example. And the difference between uh, the maximum and the minimum of uh, computing resources they need throughout the day, that difference is a factor of six, which means that they save a lot of money by also scaling down in response to uh, diminishing load. Now, uh, all of this needs to be automatic. There is no way that you can like, have humans control all this um, all the time. And there is uh, one word which, which comes to, to mind um, quite automatically, which is the supervisor. As I said the supervisor is the one owning the service. The supervisor can monitor how many requests are made to my service uh, and then scale it up and down in response to changes in load. And again, if your programming model was location transparent, um, then it does not matter whether you scale it up in on the same machine or out across a cluster of machines, because sending these requests um, to your worker nodes, for example, looks the same no matter whether they are local or remote. And this, uh, again, uh, only works if you're looking at the messages which get sent to your service and uh, you basically make it all event-driven. Um, the work stream, partition and so on, that's just distributing the processing of individual events. So, we have seen that um, in order to go uh, reactive by saying we want to be responsive and that led to resilience and scalability, uh, we have seen that a lot of it was about distribution and asynchrony uh, and these things, and that has some interesting consequences. The first one is, uh, we all know that if you have a database cluster and you want to have transactions which span like um, all, all your clients um, in, in a Java Enterprise Edition um, program, then you quickly discover that if your transactions are large and you have lots of them, well, it d just doesn't scale because um, these distributed transactions which will have to be involved uh, are increasingly uh, expensive and the communication overhead for main maintaining consistency will basically eat up all the extra resources that you put in. This naturally leads to that we cannot have these kind of transactions any longer if we really want to go distributed. If you want to have computing centers like uh, in, in, in the US and Europe, they will not be strongly consistent uh, for all but some, some exotic use cases. This um, has formally been proven as the CAP theorem, um, which loosely stated is that if y y you take um, consistency, that's the C, which means linearizability, which means everybody sees the same global order to the events you put into your um, storage, that's consistency. Ava availability, quite trivial, that the system always accepts modification requests. And P, which is partition tolerance. So it is, um, it, it has all these other nice properties even when part of your distributed system cannot currently talk to another part. There can be arbitrary cuts in your network infrastructure. So these C, A and P are a triple which you cannot have all at the same time. 
Eric Brewer um, uh, made the conjecture and uh, Nancy Lynch proved it together with, um, oh, I forgot the other names. Anyway, uh, this has been proven uh, 12 years ago or 13 years ago uh, that you cannot have consistency, availability and partition to tolerance at the same time. And this has had quite a big impact uh, on, on the industry and how you think about consistency in distributed systems, knowing that it's actually impossible to get to get this, if you have uh, a strongly consistent cluster, you know that it will not be available during certain kinds of uh, um, network failures. It will stop accepting writes. It will have to because otherwise it would uh, um, violate consistency. But the question is, who needs that? Who needs perfect consistency, perfect availability uh, during network partitions, which are rare? And that is exactly the argument that Eric Brewer made in an article uh, published last year, which is titled um, Cap uh, Theorem 12 Years Later, which is really interesting. I encourage you uh, to read it. Uh, it is only this perfect spot where you have perfect consistency, perfect availability during a partition that is forbidden. You can get arbitrary close to this point. Now, how close do you need to be? What do you, uh, what do you think your users can see? When you make a request and you want consistency, well, the user can only see inconsistent things by making another request. How many requests can a user make per second? If you, for example, play with the variables of um, how fast networks are and how fast data are disseminated, you can look at this website uh, from Peter Bayless. Uh, ha it has a, a simulator on it. And there you see that if you wait 100 milliseconds between requests, then it's extremely unlikely that, that you see inconsistent data. And that is probably good enough for almost everyone. If you think about um, uh, the, the example of ATMs, ATMs have been eventually consistent and not strongly consistent since a very long time. Because it would be really annoying if you go to an ATM, it just doesn't have a network connection, it doesn't give you money. You would n really not like that bank. You would go to that other bank with for from which you can always get your money. Uh, and banks have been living with that all along. So why can't you? So, ah, I didn't talk about the last one. Um, yeah, so we, we have uh, eventual consistency, um, which means that instead of uh, being consistent when the right returns, there's a time window during which, in principle, inconsistencies could be observed. And uh, that is um, the, the best you can achieve with distributed systems. And how these are usually built is by disseminating updates along among a cluster of nodes and gossiping and talking and sending messages. And that is why um, solutions which employ this are generally event-driven. There is a corollary to this, in that um, to, to these consequences and to, to the whole um, notion of going reactive. If you want your service to be reactive, you need to, be, you need to use components that ob abide by the same principles. You need to be able to put your circuit breaker or you need to be um, able to uh, get asynchronously your results and then you need to be able to react to timeouts and, and all these kind of things uh, in a fashion that allows you to keep your latency bound, for example. This all basically goes out of the window if you make a JDBC call and the database is somehow down. Because then you might just, your, your thread is just stuck, maybe for 10, 20, 30 seconds, minutes, and you can't respond. Uh, and it's not your fault, it's this other component which failed over there. Now, I'm realizing that um, we are not there yet, especially with the example I mentioned. JDBC is synchronous, and uh, the, the big iron database vendors do not provide asynchronous APIs. But there are some. For um, Postgres and, and MySQL, um, I hear there are asynchronous um, APIs, and for most NoSQL stores, um, there uh, have been asynchronous APIs from the beginning. Another thing is that uh, no system is an island, we know that, and if we need to be reactive all the way down, that means that reactive kind of spans across the multiple components of your system. And these will typically be uh, implemented in different languages 
frameworks, runtimes, and so on. And that means uh, that um, this being reactive all the way down requires us as an industry to collaborate on solutions uh, which cross the, uh, the chasm between different um, technologies. An example uh, of this, well, it's currently limited to the, to the JVM, um, but it bridges um, uh, uh, the, the communication of stream data, asynchronous sending and uh, receiving of stream data bet between different implementations. Um, that's the Reactive Streams initiative. That's uh, a, a collaboration of um, a, a number of engineers from different companies, uh, um, causing uh, Net Netflix, Twitter, uh, Red Hat, uh, Tim Fox is uh, with us, um, Pivotal and TypeSafe. And uh, it's an open initiative, so uh, you can join it and collaborate uh, as well. And I hope that we will see uh, many more things where uh, asynchronous uh, APIs are uh, added uh, so that we can be reactive all the way down. So this was all about the user. That's where we started out from, the user and delivering responses under various cir circumstances. But what does that all mean to us, to, to us who write these, uh, this software? So, step one, I've seen that it can be difficult. It can be difficult to embrace asynchrony, for example. Um, I've seen examples of uh, teams of knowledgeable uh, seasoned developers who had trouble with futures. Like, uh, it's so ingrained in us uh, that you get this thread to handle whatever the request was, and you cannot ever let go of it. The thread is precious. You need to catch and uh, all errors and, and handle them uh, in place. So um, for them, it was difficult to accept that I have this future and I uh, uh, register a callback on it, and then I just trust the machine that it will eventually be called. Uh, so they awaited a result to in order to print it out and verify that it actually got called. So it, it, it takes a bit of a leap of faith um, uh, for a, a certain fraction of the audience um, to try this out and give it a chance. So asynchrony is not suspicious, um, even, even though uh, it sometimes seems to have this, this kind of uh, impression or prejudice. And, uh, well, it is okay to write APIs that return futures. Even more so now that we see more and more composable futures implementations, like the completable future in, uh, uh, in Java 8, uh, where you can actually do useful things this is not about Java Util Concurrent Future, uh, but I, I guess uh, that you're all by now aware of that. Step two, you need to rethink the way you design your programs. You, you, you choose your architecture for your programs. If you have synchronous method calls as your frame of reference, they imply a certain um, restricted way of how scheduling works. So you call the method, you pass control of your thread to that method, and then when it comes back, it has done all the work. Programming with futures in an asynchronous way, for example, uh, is a different way to think about the problem. And I going uh, even further, if you program with actors or verticals or, or all these uh, new abstractions which come up, you focus a lot more about, uh, on the communication between the different parts of your solution. Uh, you have these compartments, remember? The compartments which were between the bulkheads and so on, and they communicate with, with each other only by sending immutable messages to each other. They just say, tell, themselves, uh, tell among themselves some facts, like, like I did that or I want you to do that. It's about communication protocol. Uh, and, and not so much, um, it, it, yeah, there's, there's a bit of a mismatch between uh, this way of thinking and synchronous method calls. This uh, will have the, um, uh, the consequence um, that the program flow, the control flow uh, in your program, will for these kinds of uh, communications between components no longer be sequential and, and linear in your code in most cases. So you write a program no longer like do that, do that, and then, and then, and then, and then do that. 
you have more like, okay, if that happens, then do this. If that happens, then do this. And this um, asynchronous dispatch from one component to the other is something that, well, debuggers um, honestly have a bit of a problem with. There's research going on uh, in this direction of making asynchronous debuggers, where you can, for example, follow the message flow um, through an actor system or follow how futures uh, and their callbacks are handled. Uh, I think we'll see some of those, but the focus will be more on tracing and monitoring of these applications. Because single stepping through an asynchronous program will uh, simply not work because everyone has these timeouts going on. Everyone has this bounded latency built in. And if you stop the thread, things will just blow up. So uh, in order to figure out how exactly your program behaves, you will need traces uh, where you can then replay afterwards. So you record how your program works right here, and then you replay, and then you can look at every millisecond what happened where, uh, and uh, step forward and backward. So I think that that's what, what is going to happen. What all this gives us um, is uh, what I call loose coupling. Now, I realized uh, in recent discussions on Twitter yesterday that not everybody understands the same thing when I say these two words. So loose coupling uh, th what I mean here is the bulk heading between your compartments of your application. At runtime, the execution of these is not strongly coupled. One can fail without the, uh, taking down the other. I do not mean like any uh, API concerns. For example, if you send a message from A to B, well, both A and B will still need to be able to understand the same message. So there's still, still some coupling going on here. Uh, and that is not what I mean uh, by, by loose coupling. I mean the resilience aspects. I mean the uh, scalability aspects that you get the freedom to send messages and events everywhere you want. That, that gives you a, 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 an enormous power and flexibility. Step three, as usual, is to profit. How do we do that? Well, it's quite obvious. Um, we used to have this entangled uh, code which handled all errors right on the spot. Now we have supervisors. So you code in your components the happy path. You code, if I get this, then do that, and so on. And whatever goes wrong is escalated to the supervisor. You keep your business logic, uh, log logic clean from real failure conditions when components don't respond, and so on, and let that be handled by some dedicated code. You, uh, you clean up that aspect. You also get, um, by way of encapsulating and only relying on asynchronous message passing, uh, what you get is that the units of work which you formulate can be freely placed on a cluster. You, they can be moved around, as Tim has shown. And uh, it also lends itself well to uh, effortless parallelization by replicating a component and then just putting a router in front and whoever sends to that router doesn't know that he's look or he or she is talking to, to a router. Uh, it's just the messages are rerouted. And uh, th th that is completely transparent. There's one more thing. Uh, if you have ever coded with vars, so things which can change a name, which can change over time, I guess everybody does that, right? Uh, there are a lot of assumptions you can make. If you have a variable in your class and you have synchronous method calls and you have this method here which sets the variable and the method over here which reads it, um, that can be convenient. It can also be the source of very nasty bugs. Um, in general, if you employ asynchronous programming, many of these things simply will not work anymore. It means that this assumption that you, that you make in, in the synchronous case, I set it here and then I call it and then it's still there, because I mean, I'm on the same call stack, this assumption is no longer valid at all. And being, uh, removing these assumptions is not at all a bad thing, it's a really good thing, because if you have less assumptions that you need to keep in your head, then uh, obviously um, you're more likely to write pro correct programs. So less assumptions, lower maintenance cost. One thing uh, which I like best, uh, my personal favorite, is that writing software in this style means that I program lots of little small units, which are like uh, small toy robots, and I can tell them what to do. And they are like these independent agents, and they are just fun to work with. That is something uh, I find Im immensely inspiring. 
This brings me to my summary. We have looked at the four traits of reactive. Uh, the topmost one is to be responsive, to respond to user input within a finite given uh, amount of time. And then the desire to do that under changing load leads to scalability. Um, the desire to do that even when things fail leads to resilience. And all of that was enabled um, and or required us to be asynchronous and event driven. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> now there's uh, a few minutes for questions. Where was the microphone? Who has a question? So what do I see as the biggest challenge in transition from a legacy system, so to speak, to going reactive? Yes, the biggest challenge is that it's usually, um, if your legacy system is not already a service-oriented architecture, you will have a hard time integrating it. So what you will have to do is to break out components. So you say, I, I make this one a component, and I change the rules only for this one component. This one will only use asynchronous message passing. And then you put it in. If you have a service-oriented architecture, that, that, that partitioning into components is already done, and then you have an easier time. So um, he said that's the technical perspective. What about the people perspective? Uh, well, obviously, yeah, o obviously people need to think differently. As I said, they need to take this leap of faith. They will probably need to le read some blog posts or take the Coursera course or use any of the like free resources which there are to, to get up to speed on how to think about applications in this way because I agree, it is different. Yes, in uh, mm, yeah, part and part. So th he said that we we must have seen that with clients. Yes, and that that is why we offer um, consulting also, or I should I should say mentoring. That's what we prefer um, to help people switch their mindset, so to speak. But usually um, that doesn't take much, doesn't take much time as well. Um, people get it rather fast. Other questions? Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>